So I used to tell myself that I loved horror movies too. And I used to tell my wife this when we were dating as well. And so we used to watch horror movies together. It was a thing, I don't know. I don't know why, but we did it. And so I used to have this trick to, to look like the strong one. Pete, now, now. I used to have this trick to look like I was strong and I was enjoying it. Her head was generally on my shoulder, right? And so I would make sure that her head was just ever so slightly below my chin so she couldn't see my reaction. So what I would then do is I would anticipate the moment when the Mike Myers, you know, that eight-foot guy with a white mask and the overall, like, who wears that? But he's got a, like a meter-long blade, and he comes around the corner, and he walks faster than Usain Bolt does the 100-meter sprint, that guy. I would anticipate when he comes around the corner, and I would move my head ever so slightly away from the screen and pretend like I was watching. Meanwhile, whatever was happening happens. She gets a fright. I don't see it because I'm oblivious, and I look like the strong one. I also remember when I was younger, I was incredibly scared of the dark, like terrified of the dark. I might just be still a little bit, but I was incredibly scared of the dark. And my dad, being the considerate person that he is today still, he raised us in a way that we didn't waste things, right? We stewarded well, so you didn't waste water, you didn't leave lights on unnecessarily. Thankfully, ESCOM takes care of that now. But he raised us in a way that he would make sure that we never forgot to leave the lights on. And so, there we go, yeah, do not leave it on. And so if I was ever the last one awake at night, it would be my job to make sure that all the lights were off. So what I would do is I would strategically plan my mission. I would start at the furthest light from my bedroom and make sure that all the lights were on on the way to my bedroom, right? So I'd start at the furthest one, hit the switch, move to the next one, move to the next one, move. And then when I got to the last one, that's when I had to make sure there was no obstacles between me and my bedroom so that I could flip the switch, sprint to my room at my door, fling myself from my door onto my bed without my feet touching the floor. <laughs> you guys are laughing because you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've done it too, right? Yeah, I know. I can see the faces in the room. So this got me thinking, what, why are people so scared of the dark? Why are so many of us scared of the dark yet we love horror movies? Like it's kind of counterintuitive, right? So science says that the people that love horror movies are defined in three categories. The first category of people are your adrenaline junkies. Who's the adrenaline junkies in the room? There we go. So you guys are the crazy people that do it because you love the thrill. You love the rush. Lynn, I can imagine you one of these two. You just love that rush that comes from watching a horror movie, right? Then the second category of people are your white knucklers. These are the people that you take with you to a theme park and they hate every second, but they won't tell you. They'll make sure they go on every ride with you. They are holding on for dear life and their hands are, their knuckles are starting to turn white, those people. They're screaming their heads off when you ask them how it was. They're like, oh, let's, where's the next one? And they do this, science says, because they want to train themselves to cope for real life situations. I'm not sure what kind of real life situation you're training for by watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but whatever. And then the third category of people, and I won't ask you to raise your hand here, but these are the dark copers. These are people that watch horror movies to help them cope with their real life anxieties. So they watch horror movies in order to take away from the anxiety that they have about their real life. I know, it's quite, I've really dipped down there. Bring it back up. And so then I wondered and I looked up some research on why people are scared of the dark. And science says it's not so much that we're scared of the dark, but we're more scared about the unseen or the unknown. We are more scared about what could be lurking than we are of the physical dark itself. But those same scientists say that it is actually a good thing. And it's a good thing because this prompts us, this fear that we have prompts us to take action. Right? It prompts us to fight or flight. And that brings me to the title of my message today, which is don't fight, don't flight, but stand firm. Yeah. Would you close your eyes with me as I pray for us this morning? Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would presence itself in this, in this place this morning. Father, I pray that your protection would be over every single person that hears this message. I pray that you would minister to, to the people through me this morning, God, that I would get out the way of what it is that you want your people to hear. 
Father, I pray as we define the enemy this morning that that wouldn't give him a foothold, but that we'd be reminded that you are stronger than the enemy. And I pray all these things in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. So we are wrapping up our series today. If it's the first time you're joining us, um, it's the power to change. And what we've done in this series is we've really unpacked the book of Ephesians. And what we've done is we've gone from Ephesians 1 where Paul started his letter off by reminding the church of everything that Jesus has done. And as Christ followers, who they are in Christ. And in the second half, he switches gears. And he starts to charge the church on what their role is, how they are to live out their life as Christ followers. And last week, Gareth took us through how Paul addresses wives and husbands and children and parents, and slaves and masters. And he painted this beautiful picture of elevating those that in the context of the time were seen as less than, and really leveling the playing field, as he said it. Watchman Nee in his book, Sit, Walk, Stand, which is centered around the book of Ephesians, says it like this. The Christian life consists of sitting with Christ, walking by him, and standing in him. We begin our spiritual life by resting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus. That rest is the source of our strength for a consistent and unfaltering walk in the Lord. And at the end of a grueling warfare with a host of darkness, we are found standing with him at last in triumphant possession of the field. So after all all these things, Paul concludes his letter by encouraging them. He ends it off in Ephesians 6 by encouraging them to step up to the plate. Why? Because there's a battle at hand. There's a struggle at hand that we are to take on. He says this, Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 20. Finally, finally, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Paul Paul says here, finally, so knowing everything that I've told you, knowing who Jesus is now, knowing who you are in Christ, knowing how you are to live your life, now it's time to step up to the plate. Now it's time to take on the battle, but not in your own strength. He's reminding them, before he's telling them the enemy that they're up against, he reminds them who they are and where they find that strength from because they can't take the battle alone. And then he moves on and he says, stand against. And these two words, stand against, is the Greek word for hold your ground. And this refers to a defensive position, not an attacking position. And this might seem like such a small thing, but it's powerful. And here's why. Because it sums up the entire gospel story, just in that stand against, that hold your ground. Why? Because it says that the victory has already been won. That Jesus has already paid the price. Yes, you're taking on an enemy, but Jesus has already won the victory. Then he goes on in verse 12 and he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after everything, to stand. So here Paul starts to define who the enemy is. He wants to tell the church, he wants them to see, firstly, who God is and where you find your strength, not in your own strength. That's the first thing he wants us to see. The second thing he wants us to see is who the enemy is. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We don't fight against what's in front of us, but we fight the enemy that operates in the spiritual realm. And then we know, now that we know who he is, it's also important that we have to define what does he want. And in John 10 verse 10, Jesus says, he comes, the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. He wants to steal our joy. He wants to kill and he wants to destroy lives. That's what he wants. But sometimes I also think we give the enemy a little bit too much credit. It's good to define him. It's good to understand how he operates. 
But sometimes I think we want to spend all this time casting out demons instead of just dying to our fleshly desires and submitting to the feet of Jesus. I'm not saying that there isn't a place for those things, absolutely. But I wonder if we shouldn't be dying to our fleshly desires more. I wonder if we shouldn't be submitting these things to Jesus as opposed to giving the enemy the credit. Romans 8 verse 13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And C.S. Lewis in his book, The Screwtape Letters, says there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. And they, the enemy, themselves are equally pleased by both. And hail a materialist or a magician with the same light. And so we contrast, we've defined who the enemy is. We've seen now who he is and where we get our strength from, right? And we see how he operates. And in John, verse, John 10 verse 10, Jesus started off by saying what he does. What does he want? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But that's not the end of that scripture. The rest of the scripture, Jesus says, but I have come. And I have come to give, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And so there's this contrast. There's this contrast of Jesus and the enemy, God and the enemy. But it's not an equal contrast. Sometimes I think that maybe it's our culture, maybe it's the movies that we watch, Marvel fans in the house. Such a great movie franchise. But we are obsessed with a superhero and a villain. We are obsessed with... I mean, play cops and robbers, whatever. There's always a good guy and a bad guy. There's always good versus evil. And somehow, they're always competing against each other. I know, these are some of my favorites. Focus. And I think because we have this warped view, we think that God is equally good and the devil and the enemy is equally bad. But I'd love it if we could switch that around from horizontal to vertical. I'd love it if we could understand and know that our God is Alpha and Omega. Our God is the creator. Our God is the creator of all things, even the enemy. And now some of you might be sitting there going, well, that doesn't sound like a good God that would create, enemy, create an enemy. And he didn't. He didn't create evil. And that's a whole lo another conversation that we can take on for another day. But understand this, is that our God is the creator of all things. And if he is the creator of all things, that must mean that everything, including the enemy, submit to his rule. And so this is why, God, uh, why Paul is calling us to stand firm in that strength. Not our own strength, but God's strength. Why? Because he is the Alpha Omega. He is the creator of all things. So if we come from that strength, what could possibly defeat us? And when you're, battling this, when you're battling the spiritual battle out, I encourage you to surrender to God's will, to his power, to his strength, and allow him to renew your mind. Why renew your mind? Because the enemy is a deceiver. He is accuser, slanderer. He lies and will try and deceive you at any opportunity. He'll say things like, did you really do that? If they, if they find out about that thing, mm, they'll never forgive you. You've got to keep that, that secret in the dark. And this is how he schemes and he tries to lie and he'll hide behind these things. Like racism and prejudice, pride, unforgiveness, and he'll try to bring in disunity amongst people. And when you're at your weakest or starting something new, maybe you're starting a new business, maybe you've just found Jesus and you're new to faith. I don't want this to scare you. You are a threat to the enemy. But take that as an encouragement. Not as a scare tactic, but it is as an encouragement. Why? Because you're doing the right thing. You're adding to the kingdom of God. The closer you are to God, the harder it is for the enemy to scheme and tempt and do whatever it is that he tries to distract you from God himself. And he will try and tempt you. 
but no attack or temptation or scheme can withstand this power of God. Why? Let's come back to it. He is the creator of all things. And so I encourage you, if you have given into some form of temptation before, don't hide. Because shame or guilt are not of God. It's not from God. Those things do not come from God. I encourage you, if you have given into any form of temptation, I encourage you to go to God. Submit it. Leave it at His feet. Say, Jesus, I need your help. I know I've sinned. I know I've, I know I've done wrong. But I need your help. I can't do this without you. I need to take on this battle and this struggle with you as my strength, with you as the source. I want to arm myself with the armor of God. Then in verse 14... Paul says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I don't know if you've noticed, but this is the third time that Paul has said stand. He says it time and time again in as many scriptures, stand. Not just stand, but stand firm. Why? The gospel story. We are not fighting for the victory, we're fighting from the victory. The victory's already been won. So stand firm and stand against. Hold your ground. I don't know if you guys love history. For those of you that do, you might find this interesting. My wife doesn't. Um, she doesn't like history, so she'll be bored. But I love history. And I read up on the Roman Empire. And so what the Roman Empire would do is if, they, if the soldiers felt that they were being defeated or they were losing ground or they were under attack, sudden attack, they would form defensive formations. They would form a formation. One of these was called an orbis formation which was a circular formation where they would all lock in with their shields facing forward, their helmets on, and their swords pointed out. But this was still a defensive formation, not an attack. And they would form this formation, as I said, in defense to an enemy's attack. But they were defending something at all times. I can't really see what these guys were defending, but the picture is that they were defending ground that they had already won or a soldier or somebody higher ranked, but the picture is they were defending. They were standing firm and defending with the right tools. They were defending the ground that had already been won. And one of these tools that Paul mentions here is the belt of truth. You know what the irony is, is that the enemy knows more truth about you than you sometimes choose to believe. The enemy knows the truth that God speaks over your life more often than sometimes you choose to believe. That's why he's a schemer. He'll tell you half-truths. He'll tell you things to distract you because he knows that you've been forgiven. He knows that you are loved. He knows that you have not been given a spirit of fear, but one of power and of love and of a sound mind. He knows that Jesus has already won the victory. And so he will do anything in his power to distract you from that truth. He will do anything in his power to keep you thinking that you are losing ground, that he's gaining advantage, like the Roman soldiers did. Sometimes they formed this position because they thought they were losing. Meanwhile, they'd already won. And so sometimes I think we can feel like we're losing, right? We can feel like we're losing ground, that the enemy is attacking, that, we, that we're under attack, and that I oh, oh, just can't do this. But here's the difference between the Roman Empire, the Roman soldiers, and God's kingdom. Empires fall. Empires have been destroyed. Empires have been defeated. But God's kingdom is eternal. And so the key difference here is that we have to be within God's kingdom. Learn from what those Roman soldiers did, maybe. But understand that we are not defeated. No matter the attack that the enemy takes to us, we're not defeated. And we sit in the power and the strength of the one and only God, the creator of all things. 
And so stand firm in these truths. Be the person that God created you to be. I encourage you. I encourage you to be the person that God created you to be. If you feel like the devil is hurling half-truths at you or calling over an identity over you that you don't believe in, I encourage you to go to the feet of Jesus and say, God, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Because as Christ followers, we are the enemy's biggest threat. The closer we are to God, the harder it is for the enemy to attack. The closer we are to God, the harder it is for the enemy to attack. The more time we spend with God, the further we move away from any opportunity for him to scheme, lie, deceive us in any way, shape, or form. And the next one he mentions is the breastplate of righteousness. Why? Because we got our heart. Why do we got our heart? Because in Proverbs 4 verse 23 it says, Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So you guard your heart with a breastplate of righteousness. Be careful what you let in. Be careful who you let speak into your life. Be careful who you see in front of you saying, speaking something over your life. Ask God whether that aligns with His truth and whether it aligns with His word. And I encourage you, even people in church, test what you hear from people against God's word. Because people are people for a reason. There's a reason people aren't Jesus. It's true. People are great. But it's not always the best intentions. And sometimes they don't even know that what they're speaking over your life is not true. So I encourage you to test against God's, will, against God's word and whether it aligns with his word. Craig Rochelle, in his book, Winning the War in Your Mind, I'm a huge Craig Rochelle fan, by the way. If you didn't notice that I've quoted him in every preach. I don't, he's, not an idol, he's not an idol, but he's close. If I had to like one man's arms, it would be his. Our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. What we think shapes who we are. And so we live righteously. And what does it mean to live righteously? What does it mean? It doesn't mean that we're perfect. Living righteously doesn't mean that you never make a mistake again. Living righteously doesn't mean that you never sin again. Living righteously means that you become aware that our sin does not please God. That's what living righteously is. Our sin does not please God and we become aware of that. And so we give everything to God. Not just some things, we give even our thoughts to God. And we say, God, would you transform my mind? And we live in a way that when others look at us, they see God's holiness. I encourage you to, when you, when you go about your day and you... Wherever you are, your workplace, your family, with your spouse, do they see God's holiness in the things that you're doing and saying? Do the people that you engage with see God's holiness when you engage with them? And this righteousness that we pursue, because it is something that we pursue, it's not something that just comes, it's a daily thing. It is not one, it's not a one-off, but it's a daily obedience. It's a day, daily consistent submitting to God's will for our lives. That is living righteously. Not being perfect, but a daily submission to God's will. And understanding that while our sinful nature doesn't please God, He sees us through Jesus. So take the pressure off. If you've given your life to Jesus, God sees you through Him. So take the pressure off but consistently pursue a life of righteousness. And so Paul started off by wanting us to see who God is, see where we get our strength from, see the source of our strength. He wants us to see who our enemy is. He wants us to define him, to understand him, and how he goes about doing what he does. And he wants us to stand 
and stand firm in the truth to arm ourselves with the armor of God. And lastly, in verse 17, he says, take the helmet of salvation and the, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. All kinds of prayers and requests. Be alert and always keep on praying and for all the Lord's people. All requests, all prayers, all praise. All people. And always keep on praying. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And so this is where Paul really starts to really starts to switch it on. Because he says, now that you know all these things, now that you're defending, now that you're standing firm, here's what you use for attack. You still hold your ground, you still stand your ground, but from verse 17 onwards, he calls for a struggle against the enemy head on. But with the spirit and in prayer. Bit of a funny story. A couple of months ago, friends and myself went on a hunting trip. And we all like walking and stalking. Now, for those of you that don't like hunting, I'm really sorry, but Biltong, how can you? If you don't like hunting, you can't argue with Biltong. But we love walking and stalking. If you don't know what that is, that is where you walk after the animal as dead quiet as you can and you stalk them and you hope that they don't see you coming, which never happens. They don't hear you, they don't see you, and you get as close as you can with a perfect shot to take the shot. But every time I'm walking and stalking, I wonder to myself, like, what would I do if the animal stopped, turned around, and started coming towards me? Would I shout at the top of my lungs, like, in Jesus' name, stop? Or would I pray, would I just close my eyes, stand my ground and just hold, the victory's already been won, stand, hold, pray, pray, pray. I don't know. But the picture I get, I'd probably run. Don't run, stand. The picture I get here is that we are to speak fearlessly. Speak fearlessly in prayer and supplication. When you don't know what to pray, ask that the Holy Spirit intercede for you. Ask that the Holy Spirit intercede for you. Pray for yourself. Pray for others. Thank God for the work that's already been done, for the victory that's already been done. On Thursday mornings, a bunch of us get together at the church, a free church office on the rooftop. It's a beautiful view. So if you come just for that, amazing. But we get together at 6 a.m. on Thursday mornings to pray. We pray for our city, we pray for our church, and we pray for the people of Centurion. And we speak life. We speak life because that's what we're called to do. Because words matter and words have power. They can either be life-giving or they can be life-crushing. So are the words that you're speaking life-giving or they're life-crushing? I encourage you to speak life over your spouse. Speak life over your children. Speak life over your family. Speak life over your church. Speak life over your community. Speak life over your city. And come on, speak life over your country. It's so incredible to see the Springbok jerseys, and I, I love it. I love rugby myself. But I think we could do a better job of speaking life over this country. I think we could do a better job of being at the forefront of speaking and praying life over the country of South Africa. So I encourage you to speak faith over South Africa. Speak faith over your life. Speak faith over your community. Speak faith over your family. Speak faith. Speak faith. Speak encouragement. Speak hope. Speak gratitude. Be grateful. Be grateful for what you have, but be grateful for what Jesus has done. 
I think we underestimate it sometimes. Be grateful for the victory that's already won. And finally, speak truth. Arm yourself with the armor of God and speak truth over your own life. Another way or another way to do these things is to join a life group. Get involved in community. Meet for dinner around the table with people that you don't know. Invite people into your home. This was an incredibly new, weird, strange thing for me when, we, when my wife and I came to Jesus. It was strange to invite people into your home that you didn't know. Like you met them maybe once and you're like, Oof. But the reality is what it does for your life is incredible. So join a life group if you haven't yet. And serve. Serve. Not just in the church, but serve people. Why? Because it's what Jesus did. In Mark 10, 45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give His life as a ransom for many. And so we serve, not for what it does for us, but what it does for others as well. And we serve because we, every day, are wanting to become more and more like Jesus. And if He did it, I definitely want to do it. And lastly, in closing, Dom spoke about it this morning, and that's parakaleo. If it's a, I couldn't say this word for the first two or three times either, but I've practiced and practiced and practiced, and now I know, and I spell it right too. If you don't know what parakaleo is, it's, it's up on, on the screen. But parakaleo is a Greek word in the biblical manuscripts that means to call alongside. And so next week, Tuesday, at 6.30, I think, the, the Tuesday that's coming, which is the next Tuesday. So not another Tuesday, this next one, two days. At 6.30, we'll be gathering as a community. We'll be coming alongside people, alongside each other. We'll be worshiping. We'll be eating around the dinner table. And we'll be speaking life, speaking encouragement, exhorting, consoling. If any of these words resonate with you, maybe it's a place where you feel you can give some of this. Incredible. Sign up and come and join us. Maybe it's a place where you feel you could take some of this, like you really need some consoling. You really need someone to come alongside you and speak life. Sign up too. We're doing it in this building. So there's as much space as there are people in this room. I encourage you to sign up for Parakaleo next week. Won't you stand? Heavenly Father, this morning we just are in awe of your incredible strength and power. Father, as we spoke about spiritual warfare this morning and we spoke about and we defined the enemy, I pray that people today in this building would come to realize that you are the Alpha and the Omega, that you are the creator of all things, that you are the end and the beginning that you are stronger than all these things, that you are above all. And so I pray that if anybody in this room has been going through a spiritual battle, that they would submit this to your feet this morning. Father, I pray that you would come alongside those, that your Holy Spirit would come and comfort people in this building this morning. I pray that they would feel your love parakaleo and Father I pray as we leave this building today that people would find the courage and the boldness to speak life and may we not do it in our own strength and our own abilities but may we be reminded by the fact that we get it from you and we fight from a place of victory and not for victory may we speak life May we see where our strength comes from. 
May we stand firm in knowing who you are. And may we speak in prayer and supplication and speak life. And we pray all these things in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen.
RJ was preaching, I think the, the thing that really stirred in my heart was that the closer you are to God, the, the harder it is for the enemy to get to you. And to get closer to God, you want to spend time with God. And so I just have a sense that if you are struggling with something or you feel like you're not close to God or you don't know God, this is a moment to draw close to Him, to, to come and lay yourself at the feet of Jesus. And so we're going to let the band continue playing over us and the, the prayer team is going to come forward to be here for you. And maybe you just want to sit in your chair and be alone, but please feel free to come forward. We want to pray with you. We want to support you. We want to be that community around you that encourages you through these difficult times. And I think RJ also made it so practical for us with his, uh, I don't know if it was meant to be four S's or only three, but uh, through the week, let's see God and see what the enemy is. And then let's stand firm and hold our ground. Speak fearlessly speak life and faith and hope and then let's find a way to serve in the church in the community wherever you are working um, so we're going to close off the meeting here if you'd like to head out but please please don't miss this moment this can be that small millisecond moment that changes your life forever have a good sunday everyone Oh